Excellent. And this is Think About Pain and Hell, Identifying Quality Across Possible Worlds by John Simmons. Um, this was the presidential address at the New Mexico West Texas Philosophical Society from a while back now. But yeah, like I said, I, I will say this is one of the few people in the uh, philosophical community that I'm like, hey, I kind of like that guy. And so uh, if I am overly sympathetic, call me out. Anyway. The purpose of this paper is to show why conceivability arguments do not pose a significant challenge to naturalistic explanations of consciousness. So maybe this guy's already on Ivan's side. The kind of conceivability arguments that are prominent in recent philosophy of mind are premised on the notion that our capacity to conceive of some state of affairs supports a claim about what is or is not possible. What do we mean by conceivability? To begin with, conceiving is understood to be different from merely imagining or saying. We can say things that are inconceivable, Jane kicked a square circle. And we can conceive of things that are unable to imagine. For example, Descartes pointed to our ability to reason about thousand-sided figures without being able to imagine them in order to mark the difference between conceiving and imagining. For the most part, philosophers have understood the difference between these two capacities along the same lines as Descartes. <laughs> yeah, Ivan Neal's like, yeah, uh, doing like, okay, the secret handshake. Generally speaking, conceivability alone is not a reliable guide to possibility. Clearly, the fact that I can conceive of the morning star as not being identical to the evening star should not lead me to believe that Venus is possibly different from Venus. I told you. If anyone, yeah, like you're not going to get this in uh, the YouTube uh, VODs, but I was just talking about this exact example like 15 minutes ago. So, like I told you, this guy, <laughs> I agree with this guy on a few things. Our powers to conceive of states of affairs is fallible. We might engage in reasoning about the largest prime number or a seven-sided regular polyhedron without knowing that these objects cannot exist. These are objects that cannot exist. Thus, conceivability arguments usually require more than simply the claim that we can conceive of some state of affairs. In the case we will examine here, dualists contend that the conceivability of non-embodied minds, together with our epistemic access to essential properties of minds, grounds the judgment that qualia are non-physical. All right, so we're arguing that the conceivability arguments for non-physical qualia are wrong. The central steps in virtually all versions of the qualia argument are simple. We begin with the assumption that we can conceive or imagine a separation between qualia and any conceivable physical processes. The conceivability of some state of affairs is taken to be an indication of its logical possibility. Yeah, so if you can think about it, then in some sense, maybe there is some logic that permits it to exist. So if you have a logic that says these are the objects in the world, then it says like, well, okay, it has some logical status too. If you can just conceive of it in some non-ridiculous way. If we accept that qualia really can be imagined or conceived of as existing separately from the body, then it is logically possible that there exist qualitative states that are independent of any physical instantiation. Given the existence of non-physical qualia in some possible world, we must conclude that qualia are accidentally rather than necessarily related to physical things, because they are possibly not identical to their actual physically embodied instantiations. <laughs> Exclamation lurk. <laughs> I did not know that was coming up. Thank you for the lurk, Aristotle. Anyone who doesn't know our buddy Aristotle, um, go follow him immediately on my shout out. He's a good buddy of the stream and a good man. And uh, yeah, so thank you for the uh, resubscription. Thank you for the exclamation point lurk as the uh, new uh, TTS is working. And um so that's cool. Yeah, and he, he's a philosopher of uh, classical philosophy, ancient Greek and Roman stuff. He's also an ethicist, and he's uh, specializing now also in uh, cynic philosophy, as opposed to the asshole Stoics. And, uh, you know, he's also his love. He likes an Arist He's Aristotelian, as you can see. He's a thoughty for thought. And, um, yeah, so cool. So he goes, does Ask Me Anything streams, and you can... <laughs> This chats can be very interesting and also philosophically illuminating. So, if you want to have a little bit of fun in philosophy, go hang out over there. Okay, so, because, yeah, so what we're saying here is basically because you can 
conceive of like a green patch. I hate, I fucking hate every time someone says this. Well, imagine some sort of like red or green patch of color and it's not attached to anything. It's just some patch of color and it's kind of there. And since it's just kind of there, you can conceive of it. Therefore, it doesn't have to be attached to any individual thing. And so the quality of seeing the green color, the quality of green exists independently of some physical thing. So that's what's being argued. He's outlining this argument. He's not arguing it. He is describing this argument. And he concludes, um, because they are possibly not identical to their actual physically embodied instantiations, they are not identical to bodies. Since identity is thought to hold of necessity, the conclusion is that qualia are necessarily non-physical. Since, yeah, the color that you see can be recreated with multiple instantiations, the color that you see somehow is non-physical because it does not depend on the phys any one physical instantiation. Okay, so... Many philosophers are convinced of the ontological peculiarity of the phenomenal experience because of arguments like this one and because of what they take to be the impossibility of necessary, necessary a posteriori identity statements linking minds and bodies. Saul Kripke provided the crucial components of the argument in naming a necessity. Uh, Unreal Brian says, people scarred by spending too much time looking at paint chips. I get it. Yeah, yeah, something like that. I never understood even why people put up with this crap. But then again, I like my phenomenology. When was the last time you saw some color that was separated from any object? And so the idea that you can separate like the color blue and have some sort of blue color from any other object is sort of like one of these really abstract. It's like it feels not abstract. It's like think of the color blue, but it actually never occurs in reality. It's not even like the trolley problem, which could conceivably happen. You can't even, I don't even know how to separate the color blue out from any physical experience. Like, it doesn't actually make sense. Where is a non-real, a blue color or a red patch that has nothing, uh, no experience associated with it? It, it it's just non, it's unphenomenological. So it doesn't make sense. Uh, <laughs> and it says, because I get it, everyone else, else should be able to read my mind and agree. Yes. Um, so... Uh, but again, I've had all sorts of problems in describing philosophy to other people. It just seems like whenever I have experiences, I can describe them, but then other people do it. I'm like, that make that doesn't even make sense to me when you say things like, imagine the color, like a patch of blue. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? What if you hallucinate blue? Um, what, what, what does it mean to hallucinate blue? Like hallucinate, like imagine something that isn't there. Well, I can imagine, like I can say, okay, look, I have a, um, C920 uh, webcam. A lot of webcams have copied the C920 and has little blue lights that light up when it's on. So I'm looking, like when I'm looking at you, I'm looking basically at something with some very nice blue color right around it. It's sort of a pleasant blue. And so it's like, I could hallucinate looking at my C920. Like I could like dream, like I'm streaming. I could imagine like this is actually a dream. That wouldn't be so hard. Like I just like, you know, replay this sort of experience uh, later when I'm asleep tonight. Even in the dream, the blue would be associated with the C920 webcam. It just would be. It wouldn't be just some random, like, blue colors. Like, you can push on your eyes and you see, like, you know, different colors there. But again, that's the experience of having my eyes closed and, like, you know, seeing that stuff. There is always an experience that goes along with it. There is no blue sans experience, like, without it. It doesn't make sense. It, it, you can't even, like, I, I have trouble describing it. All you can say is hallucinate, but then if you push on what you really mean by hallucinate, describe it more specifically. I don't understand what it means. Like, it doesn't mean anything. And says, how do you know it's blue unless you have a reference based on the, what the real, uh, on the real material world? Yeah, see, it has to track back. That's a good point. Sometimes you feel blue. Yes, but we're not talking, we, well, can you hallucinate feeling blue? I mean, that's even harder. Uh, what's up, hydrocannabinoid? Frank says, when you're looking at me... When you, are you looking at me? Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, Ivan Neal says, actually, I used to have nightmares that consisted of shades of yellow and a triggering sound. Interesting, but okay. I don't know what that is, but all right. I don't have, my nightmares usually are very boring. I have to do like paperwork in my nightmares. And then I have like hours and hours of paperwork. And that's sort of what happens. Uh, Hydrocannabinoid says, you can close your eyes and see colors rotating through changing patterns when on some drugs. Yeah, I've been on drugs. I've seen colors and stuff. But like, again, they are associated with certain experiences and are doing certain things. It's not like I can see random patches of like color. 
like it does like the you're separating out the color from any other experience just i find that so weird <laughs> yeah so ivan yeah i Unreal mean, brian got it down right ivan neo is literally haunted by qualia <laughs> ivan neo says even now the triggering sound makes me feel like i'm about to have a seizure Ooh, well that's not pleasant i don't wish that on you so that's no good but yeah this is the thing qualia is hunting ivan that's a little scary but um but that's the thing you always have like a physical like there's always some sort of like experiential reaction when you're talking about colors it isn't just like patches of blue separate from everything else and the idea that you can rotate out like this the thing that's making the blue it's like what that doesn't mean that you can take the blue away from the thing that's making it like i i just like I just can't when people say stuff like this. Um, yeah, I, but I'm not inferring they are non-physical, of course. No, I believe me, I didn't think that's what your argument was. <laughs> this is the thing. That's what other people's argument were. That's what these people are saying up here. Um, like that's what this is going on. Like when people are saying, okay, you can conceive of it out of any uh, separate from any physical thing. And then, so the same experience can be separated from the physical reality. Therefore it's conceivable as not being part of the physical reality. Therefore it exists, has an existence separate from it. I definitely didn't think you were going to argue for that. And I think it's a little bit of a, uh, I think that's not a very good argument. I express that's what's going to happen. In, uh, Simmons is going to argue in this paper. Okay. Philosophers have expressed many reservations concerning the standard formulations of the qualia argument. However, the present paper is focused on an additional premise that is not discussed as frequently and that must be assumed in order for conceivability arguments to have any bearing on progress in the scientific understanding of consciousness. This extra step is the claim that the disembodied experiences that we can conceive are identical to the actual experiences that serve as the content of phenomenal judgments. Yeah. Well, this is the point, hydrocannabinoid. Yeah, maybe not the best example, but that's not your fault. I'm very against these sort of things, so I'm gonna. I have things prepared to say. Like this may it may be a good example. I wouldn't even be surprised if that example gets brought up in this paper. But like, I was like, I'm ready to attack this stuff. Okay, so Simmons is saying. I don't know if it's Simons or Simmons, but uh, John here is saying that. Uh, basically. Even if you were to have a sort of a hallucination of a blue patch that has no bearing on reality, how do you actually know that the two things line up? Is it just in your head, maybe? Okay, um, so identical to the actual experiences, or is it something different? So how do you, this is the the uh, this is the argument here? Okay, I can't highlight. Yeah, ready to fight. So I was like, yeah, this is the big argument. Like, how do you know that? the qualia are actually the same as the physical experiences. Let us begin for the sake of argument by granting to the dualist that something like a quail can be a quail. See, I like John. He's using the single of qualia. Qualia are the multiple. The quail is the individual. You people didn't know that we should all call them quails. And that's so that's kind of fun. Typically, my hallucinations are crickets on my shoulder. Interesting. What's up, you diamondia? Um... I mean, are they friendly crickets? I mean, if you got like a Geppetto, like uh, you're uh, in Pinocchio and you've got a Geppetto, that's kind of cool. <coughs> so quail can conceived as being separate from the body. This assumption is probably unsound and I'm inclined to think that we need bodies of some sort in order to feel anything. But even given this assumption, the dualist cannot give, get very far. So we're granting the dualist that something like a quail can be conceived of as being separate from the body. So maybe the quail, qualia or quail can be outside the body. Quail is from the uh, Jiminy. Yeah, Jiminy Cricket. Sorry. Uh, people were making fun of Liza P on Twitch and I was watching their streams and they were saying it wrong on purpose, I think, or because Liza P said it wrong. So it's Jiminy Cricket. Yeah. Geppetto on your shoulder would be creepy. Yeah. So I've got it. Oh, you're right. I just said the wrong thing. I apologize. They weren't making fun of it with Geppetto. I just said the wrong thing. Ah, thank you, Frank. But yeah, they were making fun of it in some uh, streams I was watching. Okay, so this assumption is probably unsound. I'm inclined to think that we need bodies of some sort in order to feel anything, but even given this assumption, the duelist cannot get very far. Very is this guy's flossy the origin of Jiminy? Um, who? Geppetto? I mean, it's an old story of uh, Pinocchio, if you don't know it, Eudaimonia. Um, 
But I don't know what the origin of Jiminy is. It might be. But uh, I don't know. But yeah, if you don't know uh, the Pinocchio story, it's a classic fairy tale at this point. This is because the duels must show more than simply the conceivability of non-physical qualia. They must also show that the conceivability separable qualia are identical to the content of our fleshy, phenomenal judgments. There are good reasons to doubt this identification in the kinds of cases we are that are ordinarily taken to be evidence in support of dualism. At the very least, it will take the duelist a few more steps before she can convince us that the pain suffered by tortured souls in hell or the ecstasies enjoyed in heaven are relevantly similar to my fleshy pains and pleasures. In order to justify the claims that qualia in one experience in one experience while the qualia one experiences are the same as the qualia one imagines, one has two options. First, one can simply stipulate that one is talking about the same thing. And alternatively, one can make reference to the shared properties that the embodied and disembodied phenomenal experiences share in common. For reasons I will describe below, the strategy of simply stipulating that the imagined qualia and the content of phenomenal judgment are identical fails to support the dualist conclusion. In the case of reference to common property, properties, the modern dualist usually points to our special epistemic relationship to qualitative experiences of feelings like pain. According to Kripke, for instance, our ability to conceive of disembodied pains depends on our having incorrigible access to the essential property of pain, its painfulness. In fact, on Kripke's view, our epistemic access to pain qualia is inextricably entangled with their ontological status. Our access goes hand in hand with their existence. Yeah, so basically, the idea that you feel the pain, well, that is what the pain is in some fundamental way. That is, the pain is... What you feel is what the pain is. If we are to identify our imagined disembodied qualia with our corporeal pain qualia by reference to shared properties, then either the essential painfulness must be picked out in both instances or some other means of identifying the embodied and disembodied qualia must be defended. I will argue that it is not straightforward matter to, for us to pick out the painfulness of disembodied pain qualia. Okay, I see what's happening here. So the idea is that like either it's a shared thing and then you have to be able to like identify that stuff. But if it's not a shared thing, it's that there's like a qualia of like pain out in the world. How would you know it was pain without actually feeling the pain, feeling the pain yourself? And then it would be pain in you, not pain in a quail in the world, a quail of pain, like a quail of blue. It's much easier to say like there's blue out in the world, but you'd also have qualia of pain. So that's interesting. So what he did was he shifted the normal examples of qualia from color to uh physical feelings like pain so how would there be like you know a nice like you know like someone like rubbing your skin when there's no skin like yeah just go like this or something like how would that exist out in the world like that doesn't make the sense where you could say oh you you think you see a patch of blue that makes more sense than you think you feel something rubbing your hand when there's no hand over there like that's stranger okay so while it is possible to imagine some mental property existing separately from the body, the advocate of separable qualia must show why these imagined disembodied things are relevantly similar to the ordinary contents of phenomenal judgments. Many of us like to think that we are imagining the pains of the damned or the ecstasies of the angels, but I will argue we cannot claim with confidence that such disembodied states are similar enough to our qualia to warrant anti-naturalism with respect to human conscious experience. <clears throat> Okay, the essence of pain. This is kind of metal. The essence of pain. Kripke gives us the central argument for the modern dualism in naming a necessity. We shall see his argument rests on the view that we can have a special kind of epistemic access to pain, qualia, that makes our ability to conceive of them as being distinct from the body more than idle fancy. Why does Kripke think that when I am conceiving of my body as being separate from my mind, I am not just making a mistake? Perhaps, for example, I am making the same kind of error as a person who believes that H2O, H2O is distinct from water or that lightning I see is distinct from massive electrical discharges between the clouds and the ground. Identity statements that are discovered a posteriori show that the conceivability is unreliable insofar as our pre-scientific ancestors could have conceived of impossible things about water, lightning, and the morning star and the evening star, and so forth. For example, prior to the discovery of the morning and evening star, our ancestors may have mistakenly conceived as the two of being separate. Yeah, so it's like if you 
are in a certain part of the world, you can see Venus in the morning and the Venus, the planet, in evening if you're looking up at the sky. And because you see them at different times of the day, you might think they're different sorts of things. Like they're just not the same planet. But you know, it's, you know, the same thing now. What a pain in the posteriori. Yes, exactly. Hydra Canemoy says, we went from seeing auras to trans states and astral projecting. Astral projection. Yeah, so that's the question here. What, where do these things exist? Like we see them physically or can they exist separate from us? And can other things like just the feeling of pain have you know existence like an aura like can it exist separate from the body does it just like float along like a ghost okay we recognize that we cannot conceive of venus as not being identical to venus and since morning star and evening star both refer to venus it is a mistake to think of them as distinct is a similar surprise possible for for the friends of qualia not according to kripke in cases where we discover necessity, necessary a posteriori identity scientifically, this is the Clark Kent uh, Superman example again. Like, can you say, like, Superman isn't Superman? No. But you can say Clark Kent isn't Superman, but if you know that Clark Kent is Superman, then it makes no sense. If you didn't know they were the same person, then it's okay. But if you know they're the same object, then it's not okay. Eudaimonia says, this example he is making about Venus, what proof did he have at the time? Uh, what assumptions are they making as the author is uh, pretty interesting. Oh yeah, this is what I was saying about Clark Kent. It's a more relevant to our time example. But the Morning Star, Evening Star, we were talking about Frege earlier. This was an example of knowledge, a, pres- a posteriori knowledge. So, for example, you might know that there, Superman exists, and you might know that Clark Kent exists, but you don't know that Clark Kent is Superman. So you'd be like, oh, that's Clark Kent over there, and that's Superman over there a little while later, and you don't think they're the same thing. So you know who Clark Kent is, and you know who Superman is, but you don't realize that Clark Kent is Superman. Now, you could say Clark Kent is not Superman, but if you were to know that Clark Kent is Superman, then it wouldn't make sense anymore because you'd be saying Superman is not Superman. It's just Superman dressed up as Clark Kent or Clark Kent dressed up as Superman, whatever you are, are um, your, predile- your preferences at that point. And so they did the same thing in astro- uh, astronomy. The morning star and evening star uh, is called Hesperus and Phosphorus. You'll also see the old names for the morning star and evening star. Uh, Hesperus and Phosphorus, you'd realize those two different stars, were they knew they weren't stars, they were planets, but there were things shining in the sky at the time. They are actually one and the same object. They're both the planet Venus. So <clears throat> the idea is that could other things, you know, be missed? Could we be making the similar mistake for things like qualia? And then the author is going to argue against this. Okay. So, in cases where we yeah, ask more questions, if I didn't get a, didn't explain it well enough, you, Diamondia, let me know. In cases where we discover ne- necessary, uh, necessary and a posteriori, we discover necessary a posteriori identity scientifically. For example, when we discover that lightning is identical to massive electrical discharge, the fact that we discover the truth of the identity statement depends on a prior igno- ignorance of the relevant essential properties of lightning. Unlike heat or lightning, pain is something whose essence, he claims, has always been available available to us by virtue of what pain is. Kripke asks, quote, can any case of essence be more obvious than the fact that being a pain is a necessary property of each pain? End quote. Unlike planets and gods, we are in direct contact contact with what pains essentially are. This special epistemic relationship to pain is such that we know one property of the qualitative experience cannot do without. If we assume the legitimacy of our imagined possibility of disembodied qualia, then qualia are only contingently related to some physical process or structure. After all, as we saw before, if identity holds, it does so. <clears throat> it does so of necessity. Kripke's conclusion is that minds are not identical to bodies. Um, Unreal Brian says it seems like the Clark Kent Superman or Morning Evening Star thing are empirical questions about the use of language, not interesting metaphysical questions about identity. Okay, Unreal Brian, uh, Frager was a mathematician, and so he was looking at proofs of math. You might not know that two things are equal, 
but they actually are equal in math, and then you have to show a proof to show that they're equal. So it really is, uh, it goes uh, all the way to math, and so this actually makes a big difference if you're talking about mathematical knowledge, which is what Frege was talking about. So that's an excellent point. This goes back to the history of why these this uh, stuff is developed. Um, so it's like, it, if you talk about this in terms of math, then how do we actually learn what what is a proof and what does uh what is truth in mathematics look like? Then it becomes much more uh relevant to talk about this stuff. Good night, Lumpy. Um, let's give Lumpy a shout out. If anyone does not know Lumpy Dragon Potato, you should go hang out. Look with Lumpy Dragon Potato. Um, he is a connoisseur of making a sushi making. And he streams Minecraft and talks chat with uh, people. And he's also a chemist. So it's fun stuff you can go over and talk over with him. Uh, well, Saul's dead, Unreal Brian. So um, <laughs> he ain't feeling no pain no more. <coughs> so. Um, but the idea is that it's interesting, Unreal, because if you, if you want to drill down what actually we learn... Um, in like when we're doing epistemology, what is it to learn something? This is one of these times where you can be like, look, we didn't know these things before and now you can't do the same things. You can't say Clark Kent isn't Superman once you learn that Clark Kent is Superman because you've learned something. So this is like one like epistemic fact. Like it's just an epistemic fact and it changes your behavior at that point. So like if you're really trying to drill this down, like it, it matters. Uh, if we let the duels have their way, maybe he still is feeling pain. Yeah, well, this is the argument, Frank. Like, are we going to let the duels have their way? <clears throat> so if we, so if we, if after all, as we saw before, if identity holds, that means if the qualia is identity at the same sort of thing, um, the qualia is the same sort of thing that we feel, then um, the, the conclusion is that minds are not identical to bodies. Yeah. Many philosophers have attempted to block Kripke's path to dualism by claiming that our view of things like pains is as amenable to a posteriori revision as anything else. Steve Bain suggests that Kripke might be wrong about the facts. Uh, Eudaimonia says, do you think a modern Hume would dispute these facts as, as true until they aren't? I don't know what Hume would do. I'm not that smart. <laughs> it's like asking what would Jesus do? How the fuck would I know what Jesus would do? I'm not as smart as Jesus. Um, same thing with Hume. He's smarter than me. Um, he's one of the all-time greats. I don't know what he would do. Um, he'd be cool about it, though. We do know Hume was cool and racist, but we ignore the racism because you want to have cool philosophers. Um, I don't know. I, I really just don't know. Like, I I'd hope that he would, uh, have something interesting to say. I wouldn't even be surprised if he did have something interesting to say about this. I just am not a Hume scholar. <coughs> so... Yeah, um, you can also, the history of some of these discussions actually go back to Hume. Some people argue that Wittgenstein's arguments, which Kripke is quite often riffing off of, go back to Hume too. So this might even be traceable in some sort of weird lineage or genealogy back to a Humean argument. And then that would be... Uh, in like then the answer to the que your question would be yes you would expect Hume to be 100% on top of these sorts of uh, questions but I, I mean again that's a little tenuous okay it might turn out that pains and C fiber uh, stimulations are identical that's like when you get pain in your head it's a C fiber stimulation that's what um, the brain science was at the time then on his view we would be forced to conclude that they are necessarily uh, identical from naming necessity. This kind of response misses Kripke's commitment to the intuitive obviousness of the claim that we have special epistemic access to pains and other qualia of a very different type than our access to neuroscientific or other claims. Kripke argues that scientific identification of the usual sort, as in the case of heat, the morning star, or hydrogen hydroxide, is not analogous to the situation in the case of pain or any other qualitative state. According to Kripke, our epistemic relation to pain is such that we can exclude the possibility that we will discover that, for instance, conscious states are identical with the states of the body. On your Brian says, uh, Miss X says, over oversimplifying a lot, that Wittgenstein goes back to purse. Um, yes, but Wittgenstein definitely has a lot of pragmatist uh, bents 
to him. But I mean, Purse was late 1800s into the 20th, early 20th century, and Hume is hundreds of years before. So the whole line of thought goes. I mean, that could be true, but it would go through Purse and then all the way back. So it's like, yes, but that doesn't, uh, you know, yes, but it could still go back to Hume. Uh, yeah, a lot of pragmatism in Wittgenstein. So, or things that could be described pragmatically. <coughs> okay. So, according to Kripke, pain presents its essential nature to us in such a way as to make the sincere judgment that one is, is in pain infallible. So, while our ancestors might imagine the morning star and evening star as separable things, they can only do so by virtue of being acquainted with the accidental properties of Venus. Yeah, because you can see it at different times of day. That's an accidental property when you're looking at it. Um, if visual inspection of Venus provided access to its essential properties, then they could never have made such a mistake. Likewise, according to Kripke, since we know precisely what pain is, in its essence, we can see that it is within God's power to have created an organism like me in every physical respect, but without the extra qualitative experience of pain. Since identity cannot hold contingently, pain and, pro uh, pain and brain processes are not identical. Yeah. Um... I guess this is a quote, quote, uh, to be in the same epistemic situation that would obtain if one had a pain is to have a pain to be in the same epistemic situation that would obtain in the absence of pain is not to have a pain. And pain is not picked out by one of its accidental properties. Rather, it is picked out by the property of being a pain itself by its immediate phenomenological quality. Thus, pain, unlike heat, is not only rigidly designated by pain, but the reference of the designator is determined by an essential property of the referent. Yeah, so pain, when you feel pain, like you can like pinch yourself or something, you'd be like, okay, that is what it is. And the only thing that it is, is that exact thing. There are a number of prominent responses to this line of argument in the literature. Michael Della Rocca argues that Kripke begs the question by assuming that pains are essentially mental. While Kripke acknowledges that pain may have the accidental property of being related to some physical mechanism, the philosophically relevant aspect of our epistemological access to pain is via its immediate phenomenological quality. This phenomenological quality is, in turn, an essential property of pain. Painfulness happens to be the essential feature of pain that we use to pick it out, and this fact, along with the conceivability of disembodied qualia, is enough to demonstrate that pain is essentially non-physical. Of course, Kripke allows the possibility that pain may have other essential features in addition to its phenomenological quality, but none of the necessary a posteriori identities we discover will trump the essential property that pain has of being painful. To be in the same epistemic situation that would obtain if one had a pain is to have, uh, is to have a pain. So like everyone out there in like Twixland, don't hurt yourself, but you can just like poke yourself a little bit. You'd be like, and that is it. That's all you need to ever have to know what pain is, is just to be in that little bit of pain. That's essential. And that is by definition what it is to, to be uh, in pain, to have a pain, to be what pain is. And you can imagine that sort of experience exists without you. And so that's the argument here. Okay. Richard, again, so you can try to separate that from the mental, but it doesn't matter because that's the experience of pain. That's it, the phenomenology. You don't need any mental or scientific stuff to be going on in addition. Richard Feldman and uh, Bill Lykin uh, have argued against the idea that painfulness is essential to pain. While their arguments deny a particular property of pain, the present paper grants for the sake of argument the painfulness of pain while challenging the identification of our pains with the imagined pains that we think might be suffered by disembodied beings in some possible world. Okay, so yeah, so we are defining it that way and we're not going to talk about things that uh, don't identify fe the feeling of pain with pain. So this is taking longer than I expected, but that's okay. Um, thinking about pain, uh, access and existence. Let us examine the notion that essences of qualia present themselves to us in experience. On the one hand, there is something very natural about this way of thinking about experience. There's something intuitively obvious about the idea that ex the experiences in question are picked out, at least for us, by the fact that we are aware of them and form judgments about them. In the case of pain, it is its immediate phenomenological quality seems to compel us to judge our pains as pains. Yeah. 
While it is difficult to imagine having experiences that we are not aware of, we seem able to imagine experiences about which we form no judgments. Some experiences might even be intrinsically resistant to judgment, or perhaps some personal deficiency means that I might never be able to adequately capture the true nature of my experiences. I might be unable to form judgments about some or all of my experiences, or I might be weirdly built and might systematically misidentify or erroneously describe my experiences. So while there may be an ineliminable conceptual connection between awareness and qualia, it is clear that there could be qualitative experience that escapes my capacity to form phenomenal judgments. I mean, I guess like you could experience something and like the experience of God, like some like magical thing happens and you're just like, I don't know what happened. But like I had an experience and I can't describe it. So like some miracle maybe. Or the experience of that. There may be cases where my capacity to make a judgment about some particularly subtle flavor or aroma needs to be fine-tuned. But in the case of pain, Kripke says, the qualia and the epistemic situation are inseparable. There is a great deal to be said about our access to qualia. But for now, let us restrict ourselves to two lines of responses to Kripke's view of the epistemic situation of the person suffering a pain. In what sense might the person be wrong about the painfulness of the pain? First, she could judge and experience to have been painful before correcting her judgment. She might come to recognize that she was wrong for some reason. Michael Tai has considered cases of this kind in his recent work. Second, as Valerie Hardcastle discusses, empirical work in neuroscience and psychology have shown that the discriminative and effective motivational aspects of pain are separable. What this means is that I can judge that I am in pain without finding the pain distressing or even bothersome. I can have a pain that is not painful. Let's consider both lines of response. Ty challenges the inseparability of qualia and the epistemic situation in the following example. Quote, Suppose, for example, you are being tortured. A red-hot poker tip has been touched to your back nine times. You feel excruciating pain each time. On the 10th occasion, you see the poker as your torturer moves in from in front of you to behind you, and you expect to feel intense pain again. On this occasion, however, an ice cube is pressed against your back. For a moment, you believe that you're feeling pain and you cry out, but then you realize uh, that you were wrong. You weren't really feeling pain at all. Instead, you were experiencing a localized feeling of coolness. Um, Eudaimonia says, opiate addicts create a new pain in these contexts. Yeah. So, like, this is not so uncommon. Like, you may not experience this yourself, but it, as Eudaimonia points out, this happens semi-regularly. In this case, we are presented with the intuitively plausible case of painfulness in the absence of pain. Let us now examine a case where subjects report pain without pain painfulness. Valerie Hardcastle presents, uh, let me, revealing consequences of disorders in the experience of pain and explains how at least two important subsist subsystems, discriminative pain processing systems and effective motivational pain processing systems comprise the normal perception of pain. Pain is, at the very least, more complicated than Kripke's view presupposes. Hardcastle writes, for instance, quote, ingestion of morphine and other opiates, and there we go, eudaimonia, lesions uh, to the med medial thalamus and prefrontal lobotomies all result in sensations of pain without a sense of suffering and without producing characteristic pain behaviors, wincing, maning, moaning, complaining, etc. In these cases, patients can localize their pains but are not upset by the fact that they are in pain. Yeah, yeah, see, I've said this before, I'll say this again. If you are thinking some example in philosophy a lot of times when reading it and it's because the author wants you to think these things. They have set up their paper in a way that you are thinking along with them. And then if they can do that, if they're writing well enough that you are thinking along with them, they sort of, they're in control. They're in the driver's, uh, they're in the driver's seat and you're going where they want you to. So it's like, these people are very, very smart and they set things up like this. And so like this happens uh, quite often on philosophy roulette, not often enough in my opinion but like they they set things up that they know what you should be thinking and quite often you are okay so in these cases patients can localize their pains but are not upset by the fact that they are in pain we can all get re uh, reverse effects to a degree fentanyl causes one to react in pain yet inhibits our discriminatory abilities for the pain lesion studies and studies using uh hemisphere spherectomies show that even with cortex completely with cortex completely missing, we can still have a pain sensation. We simply lack fine localization and intensity discrimination. P 
Patients with Parkinson's disease and Huntington's uh, chorea often have a pain sensation but are unable to indicate exactly where they feel the pains. End quote. Kripke could respond that in these in cases like these where there is some confusion in the agent about whether or not she is in pain, the agent is simply not in pain. Kripke's strategy is simple. By connecting the phenomenal judgment of pain to the essence of pain, he simply insists that if there is any confusion as to whether one is in pain, one is not. Kripke must also deny judgment that one is in pain, uh, also are are also subject to the problem of vagueness. As Timoth as Tim Williamson <coughs> excuse me. As Tim Williamson has noted, there seems to be transitional moments in one experiences in one's experience of pain where it not exact where it is not exactly clear whether one is in pain. Even when one might think that one is in pain, perhaps there are occasions where it would be more accurate to identify the discomfort as boredom, despair, humiliation, irritation, or anxiety. The experience of pain does not seem to function like a binary switch. Unless Kripke is willing to countenance qualia as ontologically vague, the apparent vagueness in our experience of pain must be denied. Pain must operate like a binary switch. So, not only does the apparent vagueness in our experience of qualia threaten the notion that phenomenal judgments are infallible and or incorrigible, if one accepts that we can form true but vague phenomenal judgments, it is also threatening the ontological side of the idea that pains are essentially painful. Let us call the claim that being in pain requires that one knows that one is in pain the joint access existence condition for qualia. So, that's AE. Ty, Hardcastle, and others would likely agree that AE runs counter to both the contemporary neuroscience of pain and also, as Ty's example shows, to a common sense view of pain experiences. As we have seen, AE depends on the unmediated presentation of the essence of pain to the epistemic subject. Okay, so basically, we've got this, um, like if you push down and you make yourself in a little bit of pain, when does the pain start? So you're pushing down, you're, you're anticipating the pain, and then you get to a spot where it actually kind of hurts a little bit. So the question is, when did the pain actually start? And if you don't, if you, there is no, they're saying it's vague, like you don't actually know when did the pain start, when did it not, then you're saying pain is vague. And all of a sudden, if pain is vague, then the qualia is vague. Because <laughs> if you can have uh, vague pains and you have vague qualia, and so you, can you imagine a vague pain out in the world? Does that make sense all of a sudden? And that's getting harder. And you can see what's happening here, at least in the way I understand it, is that, look, the experience, like your experience of pain or color, they're all tied into your whole sort of experience of the world. Once you separate them out, it doesn't make the se uh, so much sense to talk about like uh, uh, like the quality of blue, the quail of blue, or the, some quail of a specific pain. And that's what this vagueness is doing. It's forcing you to be in the vague situation, which is sort of like this in-between experience. It's forcing the experience on uh, you. So that's an interesting strategy uh, going on here. That's where it's trauma umbrella catching all the pain. Yeah, so, and this is the point. Like, that's exactly the point, Eudaimonia. If you're going to catch all of this, it stops making sense to say there is a specific quail one qualia of the pain that you can identify out in the world that's separate from uh you know any physical reality guantanamo hell and my ingrown toenail that's a hell of a title for a paragraph uh section <clears throat> Consider the case of a of relatively mild pain, like the pain of being tattooed, the pain of muscle fatigue, or the pain of a blister from exercise. Pains of this kind are, depend in large part on one's attitude towards them. Specifically, one's attention to them seems central to the experience of the sensation. Boredom, for instance, makes my experience of, of the tattoo needle feel more unpleasant than it might feel otherwise. When I can see the artist at work, when I can talk with him, I remain attentive to the action of the tattoo needle, and I can feel what is what it is doing to my body without experiencing any negative effect or motivational states. Effective or motivational states. <clears throat> and says, I hate getting tattooed, it hurts a lot, lol. Yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, I suspect different people uh, feel pain differently. I've, I don't know if it's true, but I think... They've said that women actually feel pain worse because for whatever biological reason, they're more sensitive to pain. So they've just got more pain receptors. So maybe, you know, him being a guy and you not being a guy makes a difference on that one. 
But yeah, that's not to say that the effect of what you're doing at the time when you were getting tattooed does not change your perception of it. I'd assume that still holds though. It would be phenomenologically inaccurate to say that the usual feelings one has while lifting weights or while engaged in some enjoyable but strenuous physical activity are painful. Uh, and while we're on our periods, it makes us hurt more. I know. Ouch. See, yeah. So, again, goes to the point. Other things that are happening will change how you perceive pain. So, yeah. However, it is likely that if those same circumstances were inflicted by one's enemy, they would be felt as pains. For Imagine, for instance, the phenomenological difference between lifting a weight near the limits of one's strength voluntarily and having one's muscles stressed to the same degree during detention in Guantanamo. Yeah, for this is an old paper. For people who don't remember, the U.S. government had has a uh, jail in Guantanamo, and the they were torturing pr prisoners there, uh, ostensibly or allegedly without the knowledge of the U.S. government. So, I mean, I don't have I have no sympathy for this sort of thing. I feel that if they were the people above didn't know about it, um, then that's a failure on their part and. Like, or they turned a blind eye to it. So I have no sympathy for this sort of thing. But uh, yeah, this is what happened. They tortured people in Guantanamo. And uh, so this is an old paper where this is getting referenced. This is uh, after, you know, September 11th, 2001, that the U.S. government had this set up. Okay. Notice that Kripke can accept these claims about the complex origins of pain qualia, including, for example, the role of context and so on, while continuing to stick to his original formulation of AE. Marginal or context-dependent cases are not a challenge to AE insofar as they are simply not cases of pain. On this view, when feelings are painful, they are pains, and there is no scenario in which a pain stops being painful. They simply stop being pains. Um, no, Eudaimonia, they were doing much worse things than waterboarding. That's why this was, um, waterboarding was, uh, sanctioned by the U.S. government. This one, if you look it up, they were actually doing, uh, stuff. And what happened was images got leaked of, uh, them making people, like, stand for many hours, which is, uh, like a form of torture, like on a box or something. So they'd fall over or whatever. So this is not, um, it was not waterboarding, or at least it was not only waterboarding. It went far beyond that. Oh, yeah. Again, for sake of argument, we could allow AE to stand in the face of the empirical and common sense objections considered. The conceivability arguments involve us moving from our grasp of the essential nature of pain to the idea that this pain could be felt by a non-physical subject. So let us attempt to conceive of a pain being suffered by my disembodied soul in hell. Imagine pains in hell involving stipulations that the essential painfulness of the pains I experience here in the corporeal world can exist in a disembodied state. First, Kripke, thinking about possible worlds, involves stipulation. We imagine, for example, a world in which Obama did not become president of the United States. We do. Okay, so this isn't that old, actually. I was thinking this was much older. We do this first by rigidly designating Obama in the actual world. Actually, when did Obama uh, take over? Was that like, uh, God, 2008 or something? Yeah, so this may be from like 2010. I don't know the exact date on this paper. Um, we do this by first rigidly designating Obama in the actual world, of course, before building up an alternative set of conditions around Obama. Stipulation involves rigid designation plus a consistent set of descriptive conditions. Yeah, so you're holding Obama fixed in your description here. Just consider that. Like, he's fixed and then you've got some other descriptive conditions around him, uh, surrounding what you know about Barack Obama. In effect, there is no need to worry about transworld identification in these cases, no need to worry about how we pick out Obama in the alternative possible world because according to Kripke, we build the possible world under consideration up around the thing we rigidly designate. Yeah, so think about Obama and everything else is contingent. We know who we are talking about when we start talking about what could happen, could have happened to Obama. Similarly, in the conceivability arguments that we are considering, pain rigidly designates the kind of things we know here in the actual world, and we are right about the reference of the word pain, according to Kripke, because, quote, the reference of the designator is determined by an essential property of the referent, end quote. Concerns about the ne necessary and sufficient condition conditions for transworld identification of pain are irrelevant for the same reasons that he dismisses the demand for a developed theory of, sorry, it's moving around a little bit. Oh, this is just cut. <laughs> of TWI. On Kripke's view, Obama is picked out via the rigid designation. 
designation, which must work via some connection to the Obama we know in the actual world. Similarly, pain is picked out via our actual experiences of painfulness. In order to insulate AE from the kind of contextual or relational considerations of the kind posed by Ty and Hardcastle, the argument must assume that our reference fixing experiences experiences of pain are not characterized by any properties that are extrinsically related to the body or any other non-qualitative feature of the actual world. The elimination of any reference to physical properties, context, or other relations is required in order for the argument to go through. AE's reliance on the non-relational and context-free essential property painfulness comes with a price. As we shall see, it imposes difficult for the kind of conceivability arguments that we are considering here. Yeah, so always, when we, like I said, it's always tied to an experience. Always. You have to take all of those away if you're going to say pain out in a disembodied state. Let us consider my disembodied counterpart suffering for his sins in hell. Uh, Valbo says, possible world Barack is Fobama. Yes, that is correct. Um, that's actually pretty good. Was Is that yours? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that actually got used in a paper. So we've got Barack Obama and Barack Fobama for like, you know, count like other possible world Obama. Let us consider my disembodied counterpart suffering for his sins in hell. If the conceivability argument is successful, our ability to, con to conceive of a disembodied mind suffering pains like ours suffices to support dualism. But should we be confident that the kinds of pains we are imagining disembodied John undergoing are similar to the pains we experience in our disembodied li or in our embodied lives? Yes, Kripke could say, we can simply stipulate this is so. Yeah, so if you're just imagining some like disembodied version of yourself, the pains they feel are just by definition your pains. Valpa says, I'm sure someone else uses it, but you just thought of it. You know, sometimes there's a, uh, you, you can like score a bunch of like, you know, internet points and philosophy points by using a good turn of phrase. Um, you can get yourself a, you know, a few extra eyeballs on your paper. And this guy addresses sol this guy addresses solipsism. Whoa, oh well, well, yeah, we're getting there. Well, I don't know about solipsism specifically, but um, we're getting to um disembodied experiences, so it's not far off, I guess, in terms of subject matter. Yeah, we're talking about disembodied minds. Yeah. Um, so I don't think the discussion is dis like minds in jars are still physical though. So I guess, yeah, we're, we're very close to that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So fair. That's a good point. Okay. Rather than remaining at the level of a type of uh, pain, let's think about a specific token of pain. Consider pain 27. So like this one, like if you actually just, you know, pinch your own, like push down with your nail on your own figure, let's call that pain 27. Um, Okay, yeah, so this is exactly the sort of example he's using. Let us say that this is the experience that I have when my three-year-old stands on my ingrown toenail. So yeah, you're getting poked by your toenail. Let us say that I had this pain for a few moments ago and I regard it as being pretty serious pain. Yeah, those hurt. At this point, I consider how pain number 27 might feel to my disembodied self in hell. Notice I claim to have stipulated that pain number 27 is the the same sensation that I have rigidly designated as pain number 27 in the actual world. It occurs to me that pain number 27 could be felt as a, as a sweet relief from another pain, say the usual pains that will be inflicted on me in hell. If the devil decides to give me a break from the usual treatment and bumps and bumps me down to pain 27, it would be felt would it be felt as pleasurable? If so, then number 27 is not intrinsically painful. Common sense tells us that the pains are painful relative to other experiences. Their painfulness is determined extrinsically by, for example, the past history of pain and so forth. But does it make sense to say that some, in some possible world, number 27 is not a pain? Okay, so I guess you could make a threshold theory that anything over a certain threshold would be a pain. But if you're using a relativistic theory where your scale is all on relative, then yeah, if you're in much, much worse pain, then that light pain might not feel painful to you after a while. Okay. Recall that in response to Ty and Hardcastle's objections, the advocate of AE would insist on the privileged epistemic access that we have to the essence of pain, such that if a feeling is not painful, then it is not a pain, and of course, then it, if it is painful, then it is a pain. 
The trouble for the conceivability argument arises when one tries to combine the strong version of the AE principle for pain with the stipulated existence of disembodied pains in the conceivability argument. So for example, if one stipulates that the disembodied John has pain number 27, one must combine the rigidly designated object pain 27 with the descriptive conditions governing the imagined scenario. We could certainly stipulate that we are talking about pain number 27 in hell and could provide a consistent description of the pre predicament facing disembodied John. However, notice that this does not suffice for the purpose of the qualia argument. Given the descriptive conditions, hell, the history of far worse suffering than pain 27, we are faced with the possibility that pain 27 might not be a painful feeling under some circumstances. It is quite plausible to think that pain 27 might not feel the same way as it does in the actual world, given the distinct descriptive conditions governing those worlds. So, in order to block the possibility that pain 27 is not painful, the dualist will be forced to exclude some kinds of descriptive conditions and therewith some possible worlds. And this is what I was saying, you need a limit. You have to have a hard limit, and you have to say anything beyond this is pain and anything isn't. So this is exactly what uh, author... Uh, saying here, you have to exclude some kinds of descriptive conditions. So you can't say, you can't, you have to say, this is always a pain past this limit, and any other description of it is wrong. Vipers, what's going on? Let's get this party started. You are, as you have, I've, as I, if you has, uh, as you have requested before, this man is from Cork. We are reading a philosopher that I've recommended to you before. He is, I found out he is actually from Cork originally. John Simmons is someone I actually think is pretty smart. So we're um, arguing that qualia is stupid, and I agree with that statement. And we're arguing, and we're trying to figure out why qualia is stupid. Basically, because uh, the author is now arguing that you always need a context, and you can't get away from that. So yeah. Okay. I'm, on, I'm also I am planning on making a TTS um, for channel points, and then you will be able to screw with me. <laughs> but I have not got that hooked up yet. But these are the news of the day. Okay, on Kripke's view, for pain 27 to be uh, what it is, it must be painful. However, if there were enough changes to the world around pain 27, we can easily conceive of situations in which it could not be felt as painful. In such cases, if we identify pain number 27 with its painfulness, then we must acknowledge that there are some worlds in which it would not exist. Yeah. That's the rebel country? I did not know that. <laughs> This should not be such a strange conclusion for the dualist to accept. After all, she will acknowledge that there are worlds in which there are no subjects or worlds in which subjects are not capable of experiencing pain 27 is painful for whatever reason. The conceivability argument works through the stipulation of a rigidly designated object, the particular quail in a possible world that is fixed by some set of descriptive conditions. The kind of objections that we saw exemplified by Ty and Hardcastle involve objections to AE, but even if we accept AE, the descriptive conditions that fix the possible world under dis consideration are subject to the following, quote, Descriptive conditions governing possible worlds cannot be mutually inconsistent, nor can they be inconsistent with the existence of the rigidly designated object whose existence in that possible world is being stipulated. Yeah, so you can't define something as being painful and not painful. If you need to have pain being pain, it can't be both painful and not painful. So even in any possible world. Now you can have very strange possible worlds nowadays, but like we're ignoring the extremely strange uh, power consistent or like power complete worlds here okay for example this would rule most obviously this rule would most obviously exclude conceiving of worlds in which obama exists and there is no obama more substantially it could prohibit us from considering worlds in which objects violate the laws of physics but in which the current laws of physics hold um wait what about the painful pleasure plain, painful pleasurable yeah so if you're gonna say that you are defining pain as according to this feeling of pain right here but in other worlds, you separate out all the other things that could be separate from what that feeling is. Maybe in that world where everything else in the universe is different, like you're in hell, and that really is really not that much of a pain, you wouldn't think of that as painful anymore. Now, and that's the whole thing. If you can, like, what we consider of pain here, say we're just wussy. We're, we're just sort of like these really, really pathetic things, and we think the most minor pain is painful. It's like, well, I'll give you something to be painful about, like, really complain about. 
then all of a sudden you go back and you're like, well, that's not really pain. Well, this is the problem for Kripke because you can't actually define it that way and you can't say the pain is painful and is not painful at the same time. It wouldn't be pleasurable, but it wouldn't be pain anymore. No tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. Yes, yes, yes. So, what was that from? I'm blanking, but damn, yeah. So yeah, so this is the thing. If you can, if you were letting the, the pain be disembodied, then minor pains all of a sudden stop, and then you have to keep making it more and more hard to define what pain is, and then all of a sudden it doesn't exist because you've like you've defined yourself into a corner. Hellraiser, yes, yes. <laughs> I love that shit. Not a huge BDSM scene in Quark, admittedly. You know, maybe he just doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, and there's also things like that. So if you're doing BDSM, maybe you like the pain in some sense. You don't experience it as pain when you're doing it in a, under the right context. Okay. Clearly, care must be taken in stipulating worlds in which pain quality exists. Even if we can hold on to AE, that's the theory that like you can just define uh, p stipulate pain thereby disallowing any change in the painfulness of the pain qualia the descriptive conditions will have to be adjusted so as to make for a coherent combination of the rigid uh rigidly designated pain quail and the descriptive conditions that fix some possible world not all descriptive conditions for worlds will be compatible with pain qualia most obviously there would be no pain qualia in worlds in which there are no pain qualia and no pain qualia in worlds in which there are no subjects to experience the painfulness of pain. Yeah, so if no people, there ain't no pain. At least no human pain. Are there disembodied subjects in hell who are capable of experiencing pain? Experiencing pain? In order for our arguments in favor of disembodied qualia to work, there had better be such beings. But how does the dualist provide principal reasons for defending the existence of such beings apart from referencing to something like the possibility of qualia. The trouble for the dualist is that since disembodied qualia are themselves in need of disembodied subjects, they are in no position to help one another out. Yeah, so basically, when you're saying you need the disembodied subjects in the disembodied world, that's just another replication of the existence of the person in that situation. So calling it disembodied, if you're giving it that context, it's not actually disembodied. It's just a different reality from ours. Uh, what about if it's French pain? That only exists. Look, that's only from that area of France. All right. It's, we're not talking about pain, uh, the pain from France. Um, Viper says, like, bread, it's in a sandwich and the pain is augmented by the feeling. Yes. But, like, again, it's not, if it's not pain, uh, pain from France, it's just really over-processed uh, wheat here in the United States. <coughs> Let's summarize the argument so far. In the conceivability argument supporting dualism, we begin by rigidly designating an experience of pain with the word pain. Recall that Kripke's view here is that referencing of the designator is determined by an essential property of the reference. So again, you pinch yourself or whatever, you poke yourself, that feeling is the definition of what pain is. That is the essential thing that is pain. Presumably, all tokens of the type pain are such that they can be designated as such. If so, then we can safely assume that the designator for the... Uh, whatever this thing... Determined by the painfulness of the reference... Um, for the thing. Yeah. We could have designated some... Oh, it's cut off here. Sorry. Some uh, token of the pain with... Uh, okay, token. Um, some uh, token of the pain with the label Harry or some other thing else, number 27. Let's assign the label number 27 to the pain that I have in my right toe right now. Following AE, I can say I know the essence of pain and its painfulness. Um, you're laughing, but that is what your question was? Oh, okay. <laughs> Once I have rigidly designated the pain, so this isn't pain number 27 or whatever, uh, pain, uh, pleasure question is so off the mark on the joke. Eh, it's not off the mark. That's the thing. It's the question is, is it context? And if it is context, then you can't define the pain by the experience. Very simple. Like this pain is supposed to be pain 27. That's what we're talking about right now. Like you poking yourself. But if, it, if in other contexts that's pleasurable, then you can't define pain this way. And that's the problem. You can't use the qualia that you think you're using because it depends on context. And then if you just can conceive of it, it doesn't matter if you can conceive of it because it always tracks back to the uh, context and uh, the situation and the experience of it. Okay, but this is the rigidly designating the pain, just saying this number 27. I can attempt to conceive it 
of it as the object of phenomenal judgment for my disembodied counterpart in hell. Thinking about pain in hell is complicated by the set of descriptive conditions I must invoke to uh, explain uh, to fill out that possible scenario. The, wor the worry is that it, it might make it, it, that it might make no sense for pain. 27 to be felt as a pain in hell given the descriptive conditions normally associated with that scenario. This leads us to think about ways of adjusting descriptive conditions such that we can coherently conceive of a subject suffering pain number 27 in the same way that it is suffered in the actual world. Notice that by holding on to the AE, that's the rigidly designation, we are forced to be in the business of referring to non-essential features of pain number 27 in order to make the descriptive conditions work. Yeah, so now all of a sudden you have to build in, well, this pain is sufficient to be pain for lots of reasons, and so if you had it in hell, it wouldn't be experienced as like some mild break from all the other pains, it would actually feel like pain. At this point, I contend that the game of holding pain 27 as constant and adjusting the descriptive conditions of the possible world to make that world safe for the rigid, rigid designated essence of pain number 27 forces all of the objections from Ty and Hardcastle back into consideration and so far as they must be addressed in the creation of the description, descriptive conditions governing the possible worlds. The challenge facing the dualist is to explain the kind of worlds in which qualia like mine of which qualia like mine can exist. While I am very well acquainted with pain 27 in the actual world, I am less confident that I can conceive of descriptive conditions for worlds that are distant from the actual world and world where the same pain can exist. To begin with, such worlds must have subjects of the appropriate kind. As I try to determine what appropriateness amounts to here, I will inevitably begin to think of my own embodied circumstances. Prof, what's back? Welcome back. How's the baby, uh, Tiny Wayne doing? Yeah, so, okay. I know this was a little bit of a slog because we're doing metaphysics again, but, um, yeah. Okay. So this is from 2009. So yeah, like I said, it is a little bit old, but okay. Um, if you have any questions, let me know, but let's give it a little rating. Um, I can tell, I can break this down again. I think it was a little bit hard in the end, but here's the ratings. You are free to well, look at that. It's busted. That's interesting. I wonder how that happened. <laughs> All right, let's see. Okay, the first one up there is Brain Dance. You can see the stuff in the uh, chat, but I don't know why it's broken. This is a uh, new. The first emote up there is Brain Dance, wasn't you? Uh, well, I'm still that never stopped me from blaming you before Vipers. Um, is Brain Dance? Did this have fun ideas? You can copy it uh, from chat, or you can type in Brain Dance, uh, small b, big d, one word, Brain Dance. The second one is uh, Nog Grapes. That is for, did it make big claims that it did not, uh, you know, amount up to? Like, you know, it just sort of withered away or shrunk up. Kind of like, you, you know, you, you uh, balls backing into your body. Did it not quite come through? Um, uh, the next one is Nog Naval. And it's, uh, is this navel gazing? Is this really only for academics? This is borderline navel gazing. We're talking about quality here. But yeah. Oh, or then we got the Ouroboros, that's Nag Oro, and that's for, um, was deep metaphysical questions about, like, the nature of reality and stuff. Then we got the, uh, the existential, that's, uh, what is that, Nog Scream or whatever, and, um, and that's it for existential questions. Then we've got the Golden Turd, Nog Turd, right there in chat, and that's for, is it shiny on the outside, and, um, then... Nog knife, um, because that's for analytic arguments. Why do I like this guy? We turned you on to him. We have this. We had the same undergraduate advisor, so we're sort of from the uh, same lineage here. Unreal Brian says, "I'm not sure what I'd say. Seems like a respectable enough paper. I just wasn't interested. In which you wouldn't have encouraged the qualia people. Well, he's not. He's arguing against qualia here. So um, yeah, you didn't see it going anywhere. Yeah. So I think really, um, this is Ivan's highest rating ever. Yeah. You see, I read it because. I thought it would be favored by some people in the community. It's not that interesting for other people. Like, this is navel-gazing, and so this is why I, I, like, it's really only for people who are interested in this. So it's getting a Nog Navel for me, but that's not to say I don't like it. Um, it's going to be getting a vote yay. It's against people I dislike, which is the quality of folk. Um, and we're also going to get a Nog Knife on this, too. Um... Surely a fart would be more suited to all style, no substance. Well, I mean, Golden Turd's not that, uh, it's hard to rep. Well, consider this. How would you represent a fart, um, in a emote? 
vipers. Like, you design some emotes, you do it for your channel. I mean, all style, no substance, yes, but I, I am bound by the, uh, you know, the physical representation of emotes. How do I, how do you show a disembodied gas? Um, okay. A picture of you? Okay, well, that's fair, too. But again, not everyone knows what it is. Come on, not navel-gazing quality is the main entry point for non-physicalist consciousness. Who doesn't care about that? Yeah, but people don't even know what quality, the word quality is. I think it's a little bit navel-gazing, but that's okay. Um, it's still getting a vote yay out of me, but um, it's like, it's all right. It's, uh, it's good. I thought he went on a little bit about stuff. And you got to consider, here's the argument too. The argument is that he's just forcing embodiment on things. Like he's saying, look, anything you do needs a body. I don't think he actually made the best, strongest argument here. What he said was, look, it's going to be vague. Vagueness is like, all right, that's nice, but it's like you can't quite know what it is to be in pain. Context really matters for pain. That's okay. What he really should have done was he said, look, when you say that there's a disembodied pain, me in hell... The idea that you're in hell or disembodied you in hell, what are the grounds for saying you're disembodied? In hell, you have a hell body. You are disembodied in terms of this reality. In terms of the hell reality, you have a body that can feel pain. That is just a different level of, that's just a different definition of physics. You still have a body, it's just not the one we have in this reality. So he made what I thought was an incomplete argument here. He should have done taken the next metaphysical step and said, look, what we mean by physics in this reality is not what physics means in hell. You are actually not disembodied. It's just a different definition of what uh, physics is. So, yeah, and if we are all physics like you and you think arguments for non-physical aren't worth the paper they're printed on then you can see why you can call it navel gazing well i'm just annoyed with it i think he didn't get quite the uh argument he wanted your ex had a hell of a body oh well, that's good um yeah so this is what i said i was gonna rate it um it's a little navel gazing it's not very navel gazing it's a little bit though it's just i think this is um you know when people are interested in stuff you feel like it's important I'm like, I, I always find qualia to be like stupid and something that the academics talk about. I don't think anyone else talks about it. That's why. I think the whole talk, the whole uh, topic is like that. Um, so yeah, thank you all for rating. I'm surprised the, uh, of all the things that would break when OBS updated, this scene broke. I don't know about that though. A seemingly empty jar with a $50 label on it? What's that? <laughs> But yeah, so if anyone wants to get their reviews in, uh, please do now. Uh, I know it's harder if you are on mobile, but yeah. Eudamonia says that guy wrote, uh, that guy wrote, was interested in it enough to write it, right? Yeah, of course. To represent, oh, a $50 empty, yeah, that would also do it. But again, very, it's harder to interpret. Um, it's harder to interpret. You gotta be real sort of like on the nose when you're doing emotes because you only have like a they're, like they're teeny on screen most people aren't like clicking on them to find out what they look like so you have to be real like it's hard to it's it's a real skill to make good emotes all right give everyone another minute if anyone wants to get their rating in please do if not it's cool too your level of participation is okay so uh let me try something Let's see. Wait, I've got it a seemingly empty jar with a dollar fifty label on it. <laughs> uh, I've got a t new TTS hooked up, so I'm like testing it out. Okay, but um, Ivan says I would guess a large majority of people of consciousness think uh, think consciousness is non-physical. They use this belief to support all sorts of nonsense, like. Uh, some person, Kripke et al. are giving them cover. Yes, and that's why we read this paper to how do you undermine a Kripke-style argument for this? But again, how many people know who Saul Kripke is and use Kripke-style arguments to defend that? Like, this is not that, I, I, I mean, the idea that, like, you're talking about the average person being like, oh yeah, but Saul Kripke said this. It's like, eee. But like, yeah, I don't think it's a bad paper. I think it's a very good paper, and that's why I read it as I, I like this guy. But, uh, I mean, again, it's just, you know, this was not, this is for more philosophers than it is, uh, the general public, but yeah, really not a bad paper. Like it's okay. I think he didn't quite push it as far as he should have, 
I think, but like that said, I completely agree with him. I just think he needed to take another step at the time, but that's fine. But like I said, I completely agree with like the strategy up until not completing what I thought his last step was and uh, everything else I also agree with. See, like I'm on board with you on this sort of stuff, Ivan. I hate Qualia and I think it's their, the position that they get used for uh, non-physicalist consciousness is bullshit. Um, but yeah, that's all. Ivan says, yeah, it's one thing for the average Joe to know nothing and believe something false, but they got they get cover in turn from smart people who get sucked in by Chalmers and Kripke. Yes, that is accurate. Um, but that doesn't save John Simmons, Simon Simmons, from writing a paper that no average Joe would want to read either. Um, 